The BYU football program officially announced that Justin Enno will be the final member of BYU's coaching staff going into the Big 12 era. What does he bring and what does the entirety of the BYU defensive staff look like and what do I expect from them? We're talking about it on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys taking the time to check out the show. We're very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto around these parts is your team every day. And as such, this is your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Uh, Today's show is sponsored by yourself. If you want to be a part of the show, we'd love to have you guys on as a sponsor. You can email us lockedonbyu at gmail.com for more information on that front. But I also want to remind you guys that we are, our goal here, simply stated, is to make you the smartest BYU fans in the room by giving you all the news and notes you guys need to know about when it comes to BYU sports. All right, let's start off today's show with the official announcement coming at essentially half of the Rose Bowl last night. You can't tell me that that was not meticulously timed by BYU Sports Information and their PR team that Justin Enna is joining the BYU defensive coaching staff. He will be coaching BYU's linebackers because in addition to his hire being announced, BYU also laid out what the new position assignments for each uh, new assistant uh, coach on Kalani Satake's staff will hold under new defensive coordinator, Jay Hill. Uh, let's start off with Justin Enna for a moment here. This is a guy, many of you will recall, from 1997 to 2001, was one of the guys that was just a steady, steady football player for BYU, the middle linebacker spot. Uh, went on to have a pretty uh, decent career in the NFL as well, four years with both the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and the Tennessee Titans. Uh, He returns to Provo with 16 seasons of college coaching experience recently at San Diego State, Uh, seven of those as a defensive coordinator, uh, most recently as a D.C. up at Utah State, and also five years of coordinating special teams. So the nice part is uh, if BYU needs a guy to kind of step in and help Kelly Papinga at any point with special teams, as Kelly will serve as special teams coordinator, well, Justin N is right there and capable of taking on that role. But I really like Justin Enna's addition to the staff. I talked about it last week that I was expecting it to happen. It uh, happened a little slower than I originally anticipated it. And I, I'm not I'm not kidding when I think that BYU may have actually slow played this to take some of the fire away from the Rose Bowl that Utah was playing in yesterday. Now, Utah ultimately lost that game putting a damper on Ute fans' spirits, obviously. But I think the biggest thing for Justin N is he comes to BYU as a guy who understands what it's all about to be a BYU football player. This is a guy who lived the... I guess not live the dream, but uh, walk the walk as a BYU student athlete. He understands what what it's like to be an athlete at BYU, uh, what it's like to succeed at a high level as a BYU football player, and also to be able to take that to the next level and go on and play professionally as well. So I really think that this is a very savvy hire for this BYU staff. Now, there will be those out there who are detractors who will say, well, he had a, a pretty short run at Utah before going to Utah State and just flamed out there at Utah State. Now, you can you can think that all you will, but the, the circumstances around Gary Anderson's return to Utah State and that ill-fated uh, second stanza as Utah State's head coach for him it was a, a situation that I'm not sure any coach, and I'm I'm serious, any coach could have survived, uh, much less a guy like Justin Enna, who was installed as the defensive coordinator uh, coming up to Utah State or going up to Utah State from Utah where he had been the linebackers coach. So uh, I think that this is a chance for him to redeem himself. I thought he actually did a very good job this past year at San Diego State. All things considered, SDSU has had a stellar defense. Their offense is really the thing that holds San Diego State back. The defense does everything it can to give San Diego State the opportunity to win football games and him coaching the defensive line for the Aztecs, I think has given him a more well-rounded look at defense. Cause this is a guy throughout his career, mostly even when he was a defensive coordinator or a special teams coordinator, he was a linebackers coach. He played linebacker. He understands the linebacker uh, position uh, down to the smallest detail. I would imagine it was all the nuances when it comes to playing linebacker, both at the collegiate and NFL levels, but getting that experience uh, coaching a defensive line obviously will help him understand more of how things are going to work, how things fit together 
and BYU's uh, scheme when it comes to their new defense. Now, let's get to the official announcement from BYU about which of these coaches will be coaching. We already just mentioned that Spence, uh, Justin Enna will be the linebackers coach. So I'm excited to see this. If BYU truly does play that 4-2-5 scheme that I'm expecting him to play, uh, he will be obviously coaching up guys like Ben Bywater. I uh, expect uh, the Wilson brothers will get an opportunity underneath him to show what they can do and a bevy of other guys. But then also uh, Kelly Papinga, who also is a former outside linebacker for BYU. Once again, he will serve as special teams coordinator. He's going to coach defensive ends and the edge unit for BYU. I think this is actually a very good spot for Kelly Papinga, even if it is a four-man alignment where you're actually teaching hand in the dirt defensive ends, or if they go to more of a hybrid where you have standout rush ends, uh, stand, excuse me, stand up rush ends like Isaiah Bagnod, the guy they brought in from Boise State. I think that Kelly Papinga is very well suited to this position because he most recently, Boise State, coached this very thing. He was the edges coach for Boise State where they actually uh, have a hybrid of guys who put their hand in the dirt as well as guys who are in a two-point stance coming off the edge. He understands this position and I think him bringing Isaiah Bagna, I, I he really believes that he can coach this guy up and really juice BYU's pass rush unit. Obviously, you're going to hope to see guys like John Nelson, Tyler Batty, uh, Fisher Jackson, etc. Take a leap. Uh, Blake Mangelson as well under uh, a guy like uh, Kelly Papinga's leadership, but it's nice to see him at defensive end. Sione Puha will uh, coach the defensive tackles. I think it's exactly where I would have put him. I don't think there's any other place really to put him. And Sione, the one thing he can tell anybody who comes and plays for him, um, what most importantly, guys like Jackson Cravens, uh, you think the Atunai Samahe, Caden Haas returning ostensibly for BYU. Each one of those guys can look at this guy and say, okay, what can you teach me, coach? And he can say, well, I can teach you how to be an All-American. I can teach you how to be an NFL stalwart for multiple seasons and make a bevy of money in the NFL. That's what I can teach you. That's what Sione Buha brings to this uh, mix, and I really like that. Gennaro Guilford will continue. Gennaro Guilford. Gennaro Guilford, excuse me, will continue his role with BYU's cornerbacks. There's no reason to move him out of that spot. And then finally, Coach Hill will serve as the safeties coach, in addition to being the defensive coordinator and associate head coach for the BYU football program. I think this is a fantastic staff. I think it's a staff that's going to completely uh, revamp how BYU goes about recruiting. Now, does that mean they're going to go out and start winning multiple four- and five-star talent battles? No, that doesn't necessarily mean that right away. But I can tell you one thing I know about this staff, just knowing their reputation on the recruiting trail, down to a man, every single one of these guys is relentless. The one thing about the previous coaching staff is I, I, I've got I, no ill will to any of them. Uh, speaking of guys like Preston Hadley, Ed Lamb, Elisa Tuiaki, Kevin Clune, the one thing I liked about all of them is they were great men, but this is the big but. They were not as proactive on the recruiting trail as they needed to be. That is what Jay Hill and each one of these new defensive assistants will bring to the table. They are going to be relentless. They're going to match BYU's offense for how hard they go after guys. You can look at BYU offense looks at the recruiting battles they have won in recent years and point directly to the effort they put in and you can kind of tie that, uh, oh, not tie that. you can look at it conversely across the ball the previous defensive staff and say man they took on a lot of projects a lot of guys who didn't have any other offers even FCS offers they brought in uh, to the program as scholarship players they were betting on their development but uh, as BYU goes into the Big 12, development's great. You got to have talent to win football games. And that's the one thing I know that Jay Hill and his staff are going to bring to BYU. Uh, some of the statements coming out of BYU, Coach Hill says, I am excited to be working with Justin N again. I believe they crossed paths at Utah. And it, I know it wouldn't have been Utah, it would have been a Weber State, I believe. Uh, he says he brings great toughness and discipline to our defensive staff. He's a great player here at BYU and has been an outstanding coach throughout his career. He's worked with many elite coaches during his career and will bring great knowledge to our staff. I'm I'm elated to have him coaching our players here at BYU. Coach Satake, speaking of Kalani Satake's statements, read in part, I am super excited to have Justin join coaching staff. Justin and I played together at BYU and have closely followed his coaching career over the years. He's worked with many defensive-minded head coaches and he and gained valuable experience both as a defensive coordinator and a special teams coordinator in addition to coaching several different positions on defense. He's a great fit. He's a BYU guy and complements well the strengths of our defensive staff, unquote. That's the one thing about this is I think this is a huge opportunity for Justin Enna to come home and coach a, a group of guys that he knows, uh, I'm sure, very, very well the position is what Speaking of, he knows that position well, and obviously he'll get to know the athletes he has at his disposal. But the nice part is 
This is a new staff. They're highly motivated to get things right. They know they have to get things right for BYU to have any chance in year one of the Big 12. But uh, don't be surprised if you see this team start to really get a little bit more juice uh, with it when it comes to the defense, whether that's energy on the football field, uh, in practice, on the recruiting trail. That's one thing about this staff I feel like is going to absolutely get after it. And I guess the one final note I'll pass along about Justin N. I know somebody who's related to him uh, by blood, and they told me Justin Enna is exactly what BYU needs to bring in. He brings fire. He brings passion. Similar to what Coach uh, uh, Hill's statement read, this is a guy who gets after it. That's the one thing that I, this person I said is related to him told me, and they, they very much are looking forward to seeing him on BYU staff, and I think that he is looking forward to returning to Provo and obviously coaching at the school that once made him uh, an absolute star at the linebacker position. So I guess my overall take, for BYU's coaching staff is that it just it's a phenomenal phenomenal coaching staff I think top to bottom I think it is well poised to go into the Big 12 obviously there are going to be hiccups along the way things that BYU's gonna have to learn bumps in the road roadblocks they're gonna have to navigate their way around as they go into the Big 12 here but I think Kalani Sitake has made adequate changes to get his program in the best position possible going into this Big 12 era. And folks, it's 2023. We are just months, literally months and days away from BYU officially joining the conference. I, for one, cannot wait to see how it all plays out. All right, coming up here in just a minute, let's talk about BYU football a little bit more. A look back in the history books at game two of 155 independent games for BYU. BYU takes on the Texas Longhorns down there in Austin. What happened? Uh, we'll break it all down here in just a moment. First, a word on our friends over at LinkedIn. They've been a huge partner of ours here on Locked On Cougars and the Locked On College channel. And as a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that your success in 2023 will all depend on the team members you, team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have their skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. The best part is at LinkedIn Jobs, you can post all these postings for free, but also they help you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They'll help you kind of customize that post so it fits and gets people's interest. They also go beyond the resume's data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. And the best part is you can identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn jobs and connect with them fast and for free. It makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. This is an all-in-one component my friends there's no need to use multiple other sources to get the right members of your team and of course it is why small businesses rating linkedin jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leaning competitors so one more note on this linkedin jobs helping you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster my friends post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply Thank you once again for checking out Locked On Cougars here on the Locked On Podcast Network. I want to encourage you guys, if you have not done so already, make sure you check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. And last night in sports, holy cow. Now, uh, let me insert a personal note here. My thoughts, prayers, and just the, the, the good vibes I can muster go out to the Buffalo Bills. And for the situation to have played out the way it did uh, last night. It's just one of those things that makes you absolutely uh, terrified as a football fan, because I've talked about this a lot when it comes to uh, both college and NFL football. And I we don't talk a lot of NFL here, but the biggest thing is I, I think that we look at what's going on in all of the uh, all the things in football and injuries are part of the game. But the situation that happened last night, Demar Hamlin uh, just collapsing on the football field, had a, a CPR administered over I think ten minutes at least, uh, ultimately transported to the hospital. If you want uh, all of the latest when it comes to what's going on with that. Check out Locked On Sports today. It, it, it covers all the major news in sports. Now, there are other things in terms of on-court uh, performances like Donovan Mitchell, the former Utah Jazz star, now starring for the Cleveland Cavaliers, putting up 71 points and 11 assists. It's the first 70-10 game in NBA history. This is where Locked On Sports today enters the mix, my friends. Get caught up on all the major news in sports, even beyond those major headlines. Get the Locked On take of the day. Get it all available now on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, let me just reiterate uh, my, my thoughts, prayers, and just everything I can do to uh, send good vibes to the Buffalo Bills. 
it's just a scary, scary situation. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit right now, I don't know uh, what the complete status is of Hamlin. I know he's at the hospital as of the time of recording of this podcast. Uh, there was a, a tweet uh, just before I push record on this show from his marketing rep saying that his vitals had returned to normal. They were doing tests on him. But man, scary, scary scenes uh, there in Cincinnati last night. Obviously, uh, the game got postponed and suspended by the NFL, thankfully, because the thought of playing that game... Uh, I couldn't imagine uh, trying to be an athlete and be like, you know what? Uh, my teammate may have just killed over there and we're going to, we're going to keep playing football. No, I, I, I'm so glad the coaches uh, stood up and uh, handled things the right way. And obviously that game got suspended. I don't know if it's being played tonight as of recording this podcast once again, but good, good vibes. The best vibes I can possibly put out there into the universe uh, for the Buffalo bills and their team, because this is just a, a, a terrifying terrifying experience because you just look at what's going on in in sports and a lot of it transcends uh what's going on uh in everyday lives we we are lucky enough to go out there and watch these athletes compete and football is it's far and away the most popular sport uh in america and i don't mean to get off on a tangent about this because we'll be talking byu sports but it's a sport that we are so lucky uh to sit down be able to enjoy and watch and uh, be able to root on our teams in this case on this podcast it's byu that's what, that's what we're going for uh but damar hamlin that situation it's a scary scary one because it, it just it makes you realize that you know what this is entertainment, and these are these are young men, and in many cases, young women as well, who are competing and playing. In, in this case, football. There's just sports that, that they come with impacts. Uh, some of them health related, and in the case of Demar Hamlin, just an absolutely terrifying situation to have him have to be intubated, uh, transported to the hospital. It's just man. It's terrifying. And let me just, let me insert one other thing. Uh, my wife asked me often if I'm going to let my son, I've got one son, I've got a daughter as well. Uh, if I'm going to allow my son, even ostensibly my daughter to play football. And I told her if they, if they want to play, I will let them play. But stuff like what happened with DeMar Hamlin, it sends a chill up your spine and makes you think, man, maybe I should reconsider because I was lucky enough to play football and I, I, I played it in high school. I never played past the high school level and I wasn't able to play. I was supposed to play in junior high and I had a health situation, uh, actually a ruptured appendix. I'll, I'll interest a full disclosure on that. I had a ruptured appendix that gave me a 10 inch scar on my abdomen that I was unable to play until I got into high school. Now I can tell you the one thing football gave me and I, and this is not to, not to uh, say this is uh, Rub some dirt in and play. No, I'm I'm serious. The NFL, they did the right thing finally after, I think, immense uh, public uh, feedback about just postponing that game. But the one thing football gave me is it gave me my voice. It gave me some of my best friends that I will forever have in my life uh, for decades to come. Like guys that I am as close to as I will ever be as close to anybody. And that that's what football did for me. And that's the thing about this is this is a sport that can do so much good. But we also need to acknowledge at times that it's a brutal, brutal game that comes with significant impacts on people's lives, livelihoods, and their health. And once again, like I said, DeMar Hamlin, wishing him nothing but the best. And for the latest, make sure you keep it locked on Locked On Sports Today and other podcasts like that Locked On NFLs out there, Locked On Bengals when it comes to Locked On Cincinnati, Locked On Bills uh, as well. If you want the latest on those, those podcasts will have you covered up top to bottom, especially when it comes uh, to all this, the status with DeMar Hamlin. But it's just, it makes you really uh, recognize that, you know what? Sports, it's an escape from reality. There's a lot of other stuff, a lot of other crap out there in the world. Uh, but when stuff like what happened to DeMar Hamlin happens, it makes you kind of pause and think, you know what? There is, a, we are so lucky to have that opportunity to kind of step away from reality for a minute, but it kind of snaps right, snaps right back into reality when stuff like that happens. So I'm kind of getting off on a tangent, rambling a bit here, but it's just, it's one of those things that makes you just kind of sit up a little straighter and be like, Oh wow. Okay. This is, this is one of those situations that it's it, it, in some cases it's, it, it can be life and death. I, the NFL has had one player uh, die in an on-field collision in 1971. Uh, and it, it's just, it's a, it's a thing that, you never want to see that, that I've seen plenty of injuries playing football. I, I'm talking uh, knee injuries, orthopedic type injuries, but the situation with DeMar Hamlin, man, 
that's one that, man, I it will be far too soon if I ever see something like that on the football field again. And I just, I sincerely pray and hope that we can all be spared that. And obviously any other athlete out there, I don't care what the sport is, football and everything else out there. I hope we can avoid any other type of those situations moving forward. All right. We'll actually get back to BYU here in just a minute. We'll talk about uh, that BYU game down there in Texas and a funny little tidbit about how things monetized on the internet. It, it relates to yesterday's, the Monday edition of the podcast. We'll get to all of that here uh, in just a second. First, a word on our friends over at UCCU. They are offering a 15-month savings certificate right now, my friends, with an incredibly high APY of 4.00%. The best part is you can jump up to an even higher rate of return anytime during the life of your certificate to help you take advantage of this current... Uh, high interest rate and high inflation period of time. Obviously, the, the Federal Reserve and obviously they're trying to get things back under control with regards to inflation. But the best part is these savings certificates can help you take advantage of that because that 4.00% APY return is far higher than any standards checking or savings account you might have your money in right now. So why not uh, take advantage of this opportunity to get some extra money into your bank account? The best part is UCCU stands ready to help you guys no matter how you want to do it, whether it's online, in person, or via the phone. They can help you in any way you want to do it. Whether you want to stop into any one of their branches, call them on the on your cell phone, or just go online to uccu.com. You get started. The best part is the, that you can uh, fit uh, the, the saving certificates. If it's those terms, the 15 months and the 4.00% APY, not exactly what you're looking for. They can fit you with whatever you need. They have a variety of term options that you can customize your experience. So get started today. Go to uccu.com to learn more now and get started on that saving certificate. Also, you can uh, just make sure you go to uccu.com or call them or stop in and in person. And remember, this is for a limited time only. So get on it right away. That's UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked on Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys taking uh, the time out of your day to join the show. And hopefully y'all are doing fantastic out there on this Tuesday edition of the podcast. All right, a uh, final thing on today's show, uh, and I meant to actually get to a position uh, group uh, debriefing, but uh, like I said, the, the sports world kind of stood still last night. I felt like, I, you know what, I'm going to call a little bit of an audible. And we'll get back to our debriefings on tomorrow's show. But I did want to get one thing that we're doing here as we count you down uh, towards B1 use debut in the Big 12 this fall. We're going back through all 155 games of BYU's independent era as a football program. And it's one of those things that obviously uh, that you look back on and there's some very high highs, some low lows. Uh, we'll, at one point we'll get to the 2017 season and wow, uh, that's going to be a fun one to break down, isn't it? But uh, the second game of BYU's independent era, BYU headed to Austin, Texas to take on the 24th ranked uh, Texas Long now, Texas was coming off a five and seven season. This is before uh, Texas is back, became kind of that meme every year that they seemingly just continue to fail. Uh, but they were ranked 24th, and BYU was going in as a pretty significant underdog despite the win over Ole Miss the week before. Uh, this, funny enough, was the first road trip of mine during the independent era for BYU. I believe I, throughout the independent era, I think I averaged at least one road game annually, and this was my one in 2011 uh, going up. Uh, to uh, going up, going down to Austin, Texas, to watch BYU take on the Texas Longhorns. It was crazy, crazy hot. I vividly remember that. 98 degrees at kickoff, according to the official report. I, I pulled it up. It was blazing hot, but as you would expect in early to mid September in Texas, it's still gonna be very, very warm. But BYU got off to a very good start. I remember thinking, okay, BYU, they showed something. They came back in that fourth quarter a week ago against Ole Miss, and uh, then BYU got up 13 0 in the first half of this game against Texas. They ultimately went into the locker room leading 13 to 3. You have a two score lead, you're feeling like, okay. We've got an opportunity here. And uh, you're probably wondering, well, Jake, why aren't you showing some of the highlights here? Let me let me just insert this real quick. Uh, on yesterday's podcast, the Monday edition of the show, I inserted the strip sack that Kyle Van Noy had to win the game for BYU in that debut of their independent era. Uh, and apparently ESPN, no matter how old the clip is from ESPN, if you happen to put it on a podcast that happens to get on YouTube, uh, there's a copyright uh, mark uh, that is uh, put on there. And they will like essentially put the Kai or at least limit the amount of views your podcast gets on YouTube. So lesson learned, 
Uh, and these are going to be more oral histories with regards to BYU's independent era in these games. That's why I'm talking about the BYU Texas game, giving you my insight because I, I can talk about this one personally because I was there. I covered the entirety of BYU's independent era. I, I probably should have talked more about that when it came to the Ole Miss game. But uh, speaking of this Texas game, Jake Heaps was pretty effective early on. He did throw two interceptions against one uh, touchdown. Actually, the second straight game that he hooked up with Ross Oppo. I remember thinking in, in 2011, the Ross Oppo was going to be the next great BYU wide receiver. A uh, little do we know that Cody Hoffman was already on his way to superstardom and Ross Oppo's uh, finger injury that I think he suffered that season obviously would uh, negate uh, much of an opportunity for him to be the force that you look like he was early on. But once again, BYU had a 13 to three lead at halftime. You're thinking, okay, can they make this two and oh, and suddenly BYU could be ranked in the top 25. Well, in the second half, Texas realized that, Hey, we are Texas. We're bigger, we're stronger, more physical than BYU, and that's what we're going to do. They also benched Garrett Gilbert, who was the heir apparent to uh, Colt McCoy, and uh, the Colt McCoy saga, the fact that he's still playing in the NFL to this day is crazy to me, but Garrett Gilbert was completely ineffective. Uh, they ultimately made the call to bench him and go with a combo of Case McCoy, the younger brother of Colt McCoy and David Ash at quarterback, and that proved to be a huge difference in this game. They went 7-9 of nine passing in the second half uh, for Texas. They also had 100 166 rushing yards in the game. Speaking of Longhorns, the vast majority of that coming in the second half is really started to wear down BYU in that Texas heat and humidity. And uh, they ultimately took the lead as Cody Johnson bowled over Daniel Sorens from the go-ahead TD. Many of you recall that with a, a, it was in the fourth quarter uh, for BYU as they felt behind 17 to 16. Now, I was sitting in the stands, and BYU had done and shown some signs that they could uh, move the ball a little bit. In the second half, they had too, way too many three and outs, too many uh, times where they had to punt the ball in the second half of this game. Uh, Texas got the ball back. I believe it was about four minutes to go, if I recall correctly. And they got to a third and six situation. And I remember thinking, okay, there's about two minutes and it was like two and two minutes and 35 seconds. Uh, I think is what I looked up. And I was, I remember sitting there vividly thinking, okay, if BYU can get the stop here, they punt the ball away and maybe Jake keeps and the offense can get just enough going here using guys like Ross Oppo, Cody Hoffman, uh, et cetera, to move the ball down the field and just set up for a field goal. Just get us into field goal range, kick the field goal, win the game, get out of Texas with just a huge victory. Well, Brian Harson, yes, the future Boise State uh, uh, head coach, who actually just come down to Texas as their offensive coordinator. He's a first-year coordinator at Texas. Well, he went with a, a Wildcat formation with David Ash lined up out wide. And in the Wildcat way back then, it was all in vogue. In the wide receiver position as a quarterback, you're essentially supposed to stand there and look pretty for lack of a better term. Well, David Ash actually uh, takes off downfield and uh, 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 Jordan Shipley, if I uh, yeah, Jordan Shipley came across on that wildcat, took a, like a, a like essentially like a, what do you call it? A fly sweep look from the running back who uh, took the snap and they tosses the ball downfield to David Ash for some razzle dazzle and a big first down. After that, BYU was up against it, having to use their timeouts, trying to get a stop. Uh, one more big run from Cody Johnson, ultimately salted the game away for, uh, for the Texas, Longhorns and BYU fell to one and one with a 17 to 16 loss to the Texas Longhorns. I remember sitting in the stands uh, watching that game thinking, you know what? How close was that to being a different game for BYU? And had they been able to continue to do what they did in the first half, carry over uh, some of what they did in the first half, especially having a fairly decent passing attack, maybe things would have been different for BYU. But alas, uh, just 43 total yards rushing did BYU and they could not sustain any significant type of rushing attack. And BYU falls to one on one, uh, fall, fell to one and one on the season. And in some ways, maybe that loss, maybe the, the disappointing nature of that loss had a hangover effect as Utah came to town to Provo for the first matchup in independence. Utah, a member of the Pac-12 in their first year as a Pac-12 member. BYU is an independent member. We'll talk about what happened on that fateful night down there at LES on tomorrow's podcast. That'll do it for today's edition of the show. A huge thank you once again for your support of the podcast. As always, uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me as I talked more about just kind of bigger picture stuff when it comes to sports, but also fit in a lot of BYU talk as well. We'll get back to our position debriefings on tomorrow's show. And yes, we will also talk about the turnover fest that was 54 to 10 
on tomorrow's podcast. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work our way through it. It was a disappointing and just just a, a it gives people nightmares to this day. I get that, but we need to talk about it. We'll talk about that all on tomorrow's show. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. I want to encourage you once again to make your second listen. Our friends over at the Locked On Big Twelve podcast they are getting you ready all week long for the matchup between the Frogs and the Dogs, the TCU Horn Frogs playing for a national championship. BYU soon to be a member of the Big 12 Conference, which TCU is representing down there in the CFP National Championship game next Monday. Get all the latest on that from the Locked On Big 12 podcast. And by extension, also check out Locked On Horn Frogs. Uh, Stephen Simcox is your host uh, covering all things TCU on that show as well. But until tomorrow, have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.